okay, this tape is going to be on Atlantis, okay, and I'm going to bring up a personality that we've all heard of. His name is Plato. Plato was a Greek philosopher more than 2,000 years ago. He talked about the city of Atlantis, okay, he talked a lot about the city of Atlantis. It's always been a mystery to us. Um, it was a major sea power by around 9600 BC. It is claimed 9600 BC. Well, that would predate Adam. But um, it could have been a um, much later time than that. Um, also, it was an earthquake that took it out. Atlantis, the whole continent of Atlantis was taken out and submerged underwater, okay? For whatever reason, it took a judgment and went underwater. Scholars have never been able to relocate the real Atlantis. I'm getting this information, just brief, uh, from HistoryOMG.com. Um, it was titled, Amazing Facts About the Lost City of Atlantis. And this is just a little bit of Plato version. But anyway, um, it is very, it just briefly hits on um, that it was the earthquake that destroyed it. Plato wrote a lot about it, okay? And then in 2011, um, all these news articles came out. Um, NBC came out with it. I mean, it hit the papers that um, they thought they had found Atlantis. You know, Huffington Post came out with an article, Atlantis Lost City Swamped by Tsunami May Be Found. Also, Daily Mail came out with it. Um, has the real lost city of Atlantis finally been found, buried under mudflats in Spain? Um, they believed that they had found the real Atlantis in Cadiz, in Spain. So, anyway, I don't know whatever became of the articles, but the thing is, Atlantis has always been a very big mystery, okay? And it is known to be a pre-Adamic time city, okay, that had inhabitants. The next thing, I would like to bring your attention to another website called MysteriousWorld.com. This is where I got this information. I'm not sure if the person who wrote the articles here, if they are Christian, if they are Gnostic, but whoever wrote the articles um, keeps wanting to go back to Noah's time, but this predates Noah's time. And so, anyway, he wrote a article, The Legend of Atlantis, and there was part one, two, and three. One of the parts just fully covers Plato. If you're interested in knowing more about what Plato had to say, it also has another uh, section from the Christian point of view on Atlantis, which he's trying to tie it in with Noah's Ark. I disagree, because just like in Jeremiah 4, uh, this cannot be tied in with Noah's Ark. There was a time where there were people before us. Okay, but the attention I would like to draw is on another person um, that they write about, and this is in part three of The Legend of Atlantis. Now, before I get into who it is and what this person had to say, I do want to bring a scripture to you that we're going to cover. It is Ephesians 5, 6 through 14. Ephesians 5. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be, ye, be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are, are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Okay. 
the point of this passage of scripture that I read is to have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. Okay? That means that there are certain things that we are forbidden to do in scripture. So I am not endorsing anything here. I am bringing up a personality with some very strange history. I don't want to say facts. Some of it, eh, some of it's very, very peculiar. But there's a reason why I'm bringing this up. Anyway, part three, we are talking about Edgar Cayce. They called him the sleeping prophet. Okay? He was born in Kentucky in 1877. Edgar Cayce. I'm going to give you a brief history, just a brief summary of who he was, what he's known for. I am going to say up front, this man was a 33rd degree Mason. He was in the know. Um, his beliefs, I would say, were more Gnostic than Christian. Okay, but I am going to give you a brief history on him. Okay? When he was nine years old, he had a vision and a very beautiful woman appeared to him. Um, do I believe this could have happened? Yeah, I believe it could have happened. Look at Joseph Smith, another high-ranking 33rd degree Mason, another one that claimed to saw an angel of light. Okay, I believe they could have seen these things. Yes, I do. Anyway, at nine, she asked him, she said, if you could have anything you want, what would it be? And he said, I just want to help people, which is a very noble thing. Okay. So after this vision, he tells his family about it, and his family is looking at him as just the over-imaginative, um, you know, the over-imagination of a young child. They're not really taking it too seriously. So anyway, um, Edgar gets this idea that he is going to read his Bible cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, once a year, every year for the rest of his life. Okay? So he knew his Bible. Whether or not he did it the rest of his life, I don't know. But he did know his Bible. He did read it. Okay? So then when he's about 12 years old, he uh, encounters another strange phenomena. He realizes upon falling asleep with his head on a textbook that upon awakening he is able to recite everything in that entire book cover to cover without even having read it. Well, he discovers he could do this with any textbook. And by then his family's thinking, wow, you know, there is something strange going on here. Okay, so anyway, this continues. And then about the age of 20 or 21, Edgar Casey develops this case of laryngitis that not only messes up his voice, but it takes it away completely. So when the doctors diagnosed this case of laryngitis, they realize that it's not going away. Nothing that they're doing, none of the medications of the time, nothing is taking away the laryngitis. So what happens then is they put him under hypnosis, and under hypnosis, he suddenly can speak fluently, like there's no problem. And he gives them a diagnosis of what is actually wrong with him and all the herbal remedies that they need to fix it. Okay? And it happens, and he gets his voice back. So then he starts going under hypnosis to help other people that have other ailments. And when he, you know, after a while, he, as the story goes, he's so good at going under hypnosis. And first of all, I want to say, as Christians, we do not go under hypnosis. You are not to go under hypnosis. Casey should have known this if he really did read his Bible cover to cover. Okay. So anyway, he's diagnosing all these things, showing them how to put herbal remedies together to get rid of the illness. Okay. And I, he goes, and then it goes beyond the herbal remedies. But here we are. He has now developed a reputation, and today he is known as the father of holistic medicine. Okay? I personally use holistic medicine, but there are things in holistic medicine where we have to draw the line. Okay? It crosses a line. And um, anyway, so Edgar Casey then is no longer going under these hypnosis. He um, 
is, you know, after a while, he could hypnotize himself. He only needed a transcriber. But then after that, he starts doing psychic readings. Aha! Again, as a Christian, if he really was reading a Bible, um, he would have had a problem with doing psychic readings. But as the story goes, he's doing psychic readings on people, and then he starts having this conflict with the Bible and with what he believes he sees. Okay? Doesn't have a conflict with the Bible about the psychic readings, but he's got a conflict with the Bible because he believes that millions, you know, or hundreds of thousands of people have been reincarnated. Okay? And this is just not jiving with the Bible. Okay. Strangely enough, he's got a problem with this. Um, what happens is, he's not only diagnosing things that are physical ailments, but also people that have mental ailments. Um, you know, a person would be having these anger issues, and he would tell them, you know, before this life, in a past life, you murdered somebody, and you brought this into this life. Okay? And that is the root of all these anger issues. Okay, so... Anyway, he's doing this and diagnosing these things, but that is not the point that I want to make here. The point I want to make here is that he also had visions of Atlantis. And, as we will see, some of these might have had some validity to it, because as we go further in all these studies, we're going to see some truths here. Do I believe that deception can have some truth in it? Sure I do. You know? You know, a lot of people that get deceived, and I believe that, um, Ed, I believe that Edgar Casey was deceived. Um, there's some truth in everything, and then you become deceived by the lies. So, anyway, um, getting on to some of the visions that Edgar Casey had concerning Atlantis. One of the most common recurring themes, and this is the deception, in Casey's life readings has been Atlantis. Many people who formerly lived in Atlantis, according to Casey, have been reincarnating into bodies in the 20th century, not all of them for the good. Okay. Um, I would also like to mention that this article, one more time I'm going to mention, I got this from MysteriousWorld.com. In Casey's visions, the geography of the world at the time when human history began on Atlantis was dramatically different than it is today. Many areas of Earth that today are ocean were once dry ground, and many places that were once lush and fertile are now desert. This article then goes on to explain that parts of Europe were underwater that are no longer underwater, and that parts of Europe um, that are above ground are now underwater. Also, besides that, let me get this. Also, besides that, um, he starts talking about the United States of America and how parts of the U.S. were underwater and are now mountains and vice versa. Okay, and then the article goes on to say that the strangest thing, difference, however, though these differences were dramatic, the most dramatic difference of all, according to Casey's reading, was that the Earth was, from our perspective, actually upside down. Okay? The North Pole now occupying the area that was once the South Pole and vice versa. Also, according to Casey, Atlantis occupied the same position it did in Plato's writings. No surprise there. Moving on. Many lands have disappeared. Many have appeared and disappeared again and again during these periods. Casey also stated that the population of Earth at the time of the foundation of Atlantis was fairly large, over 130 million, and that man has been in existence for over 10.5 million years. Okay. He described the beginning of mankind as five different races black, brown, red, yellow, and white. Okay? And that five meant mortal man. Man had five fingers, five toes on each finger and hand. 
that we have five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. Okay? Um, it's just, they're briefly going over a numerology of sort where man's number is five. Okay. Casey's description, ah, wait, I'm going to go back. As I understand this statement, it refers to the five physical senses, sight, touch, hearing, smelling, and taste. It sounds as if spiritual beings projected themselves into materiality um, specifically to participate in experiencing the senses or sensations common to a physical body. So what he's saying here is that something angelic, something that was not of this world, wanted to see what it was like to inhabit a body. And so um, they created this. Okay, sounds strange. All right, the Casey's description of the first beings on earth is a little odd. Apparently, according to his visions, before Adam was created, a group of spiritual beings physically manifested themselves into the physical plane by sheer, sheer force of will, creating material bodies for themselves that were not truly human as we understand humanity. They took on a cloak. A cloaking. That's what he's saying. We will definitely be revisiting this type of stuff. <laughs> okay. As of their forms in the physical sense, these were much rather um, the nature of thought forms and they were able to push out of themselves in that direction. They're, okay, he's talking about their development. As these took form by the gratifying of their own desire for that which builded or added to the material conditions, they became hardened or set. They weren't touchy-feely like humans like we know today. They're very hardened, you know. Let's just put it bluntly. They were soulless beings. You know, Adam was created a living soul. He's saying, we didn't have that. Didn't have that at all. And we will get more into this. Okay, they became hardened or set much in the form of the existent human body of the day, our day, with that color as partook of their surroundings much in the manner as the chameleon in the present. What he's saying here is that wherever they lived or whatever the conditions that they lived in upon this earth, which is different in different places, they took on that form, you know? Um, if it were to happen in today's time, what they're saying is, if he grew up in Ireland, he would look, they would look like the Irish. If they grew up in the Americas, they would look more like the American people. If they grew up in Asia, they would take on the form of Asians. That their bodily form was a cloak, okay? It was a cloaking. And they also m made bodies for themselves because they wanted to... Um, they wanted to be able to sense all these things that they could never sense as angelic beings. Okay? These beings, according to Casey's testimony, appear to have predated Adam. A survey of Casey's visions on the subject gives the idea that a race of humanoid beings inhabited Earth before God created Adam, but not before animals, which also predated Adam in Casey's visions. That's real interesting because we are going to cover that. Um, we're going to cover that in our next video. Animals were also created before man, according to the account in Genesis 1. Most likely, the animals of Genesis 2 were the animals we know today. Okay, if I'm reading this right, he's trying to say the author is trying to say, this is not Edgar Casey necessarily, but the author is saying in comparison that Genesis 1 is more like the period of time between Genesis verse 1 and verse 2 and that Genesis 2 um, came afterward the creation of Adam with the animals, etc. Okay? Most likely, the animals of Genesis 2 were the animals we know today, and the animals of the time of the pre-Adamic race, described by Casey and covered by the account in Genesis 1, were probably those of the Pleistocene, of the Pleistocene 
period, which is 1,800,000-9,000 B.C. That is mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, and primitive man-like creatures, like Bigfoot. Okay? Casey explains the odd nature of these early pre-Adamic humans. I would interpret it as implying that the Earth was proceeding along an evolutionary pattern. Okay, I disagree with that part because, and this is according to the writer, I disagree with that because we know that evolution, we do not believe in evolution. We didn't, man didn't come from an ape, okay? These ape-like beings were here. But we don't see man evolving today either. We don't even see anybody in transition of evolving. Okay? Nor has mankind ever seen that. So, anyway. Um, he's saying it sounds, this is the author, it sounds as if they, in many cases, mixed with animals. The results being sometimes quite bizarre. I think there's some truth there, and we'll cover that. So now the very last thing. So according to Casey, there was indeed a race of humans, or at least human-like beings, before the creation of Adam. In Atlantean land, before Adam, the entity was timekeeper for those who were called things or servants or workers of the people. These spiritual beings who had taken on primitive fleshly forms apparently decided that the material forms they had originally taken on were too effic inefficient to perform everyday tasks efficiently and decided a new form of mankind had to be created. I'm going to stop there. A little bit further down it says some Jewish legends also support the idea of a pre-Adamic race. Okay, now this is Jewish legend. Okay, so Edgar Casey and Plato both talked, they were both sources of information talking about Atlantis. There have been others, but these are the two most well-known sources that I put out there for you. We are going to come back, we're not going to go back to Edgar Casey, but a lot of what he said, that type of material is going to be covered in our future sessions. The next thing that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to put this in the next video for the sake of time, is that um, we are going to look at an account of creation. We are going to compare Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 creation, um, and we are going to just examine this. We're not going to read every single little thing, but we are going to kind of go through it as quickly as we can uh, because there are a lot of things that most people overlook. Um, with that, I say be blessed.